Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week in our festive holiday show are our brilliant wives, Mary Madeline and Judy Woodruff, who make us look better every day. Now remember, we love taking your questions. So write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. And please check out the links to our sponsors, Miracle Made, Collective, and Song Finch in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting these sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. James, um, a big story this week, the Colorado State Supreme Court said that um, Trump is not eligible uh, for the ballot because he uh, led an uh, insurrection um, against the government back on January 6th. That's an old Civil War statute, 14th Amendment. So does anyone that leads an insurrection uh, can't run for an office? Um, I, I, I think there is a legal case that's powerful here. And really good lawyers like Michael Ludig and Lawrence Tribe have embraced it. I think Trump clearly led an insurrection. But I think this is a mistake. I think it's a mistake for two reasons. I think it'll just engender sympathy for him and that his um, his line that they're out to get me, the establishment, the elites, the deep state, this is another proof. You know, they're afraid of me. Um, and I think, secondly, that the U.S. Supreme Court is almost certainly going to overrule this. And so what you end up with is Trump having this issue uh, and it not affecting uh, any any ballots. There's one way and only one way probably to defeat Trump over the next year, and that's at the ballot box. And, um, you know, I, I as much as I think he's guilty of everything he's charged with as far as an insurrection is concerned, I, I, I really regret that four to three Colorado State Supreme Court decision. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh I'm sure it's uh, people have texted me and have read some stuff and it's very soundly written and it anticipates every argument and it's going to, it, by the way, if we keep him off the ballot in Colorado, but I want Colorado in a chance anyway, so really not that big a deal. Yeah, and it's only the primary ballot. <laughs> right, right. I, it's, and, but the symbolism of it, I think, is is not helpful at all. And I just think a lot of Democrats, you see commentary, just anything, and they're not thinking this thing through. And we're, I got to tell you, we're in a very, very precarious situation here. And we don't need, you know, we got to stay focused on trying to beat this guy. And I'm not sure that anybody has an idea yet. It's just not going very well. But this no, is not going to help anything. And, and as you have noted, uh, it is clearly his major theme, and I guess his major appeal is it's us versus them. And this just plays into the us versus them theme. It's phony, by the way, uh, yeah. because he really doesn't represent those people he claims he represents. Uh, but uh, I think this is just another you know, another blow. Right. And, uh, you know, I hope the Supreme Court takes it up soon and overturns the Colorado. Right. Well, I'll just say this. I'm going to amplify it further. Trump is as much a theological figure as he is a political figure. And to not understand that is to miss the point. I mean, every theme in the Bible, from deliverance to redemption to persecution to oppression, is all contained in the Trump narrative. And his people view all of this as just they're persecuting him. You know, he's being oppressed because he speaks out for us. It's all made up. And the the clear answer to this it, within that construct is that betrayal. But we'll get into this deeper, but I, I, I do think this feeds into the, Trump as a theological figure. And particularly, like, not just the, the evangelicals at a point, but also he's got a huge secular vote. But they, they like the narrative of deliverance and this is strong, strong, toxic stuff we're dealing with out there. And I'm just not confident that we understand the nature of the threat. But I hope we'll continue to evolve. I think that's an interesting point, James. And on the, evan the white nationalist, the evangelical vote, and 
they overlap some. I think Tim Alberta, uh, our great guest of about three weeks ago, makes a point. Right. Many of these people are totally convinced that the secular community is out to get rid of them, is out to eviscerate them. Right. Uh, and that the only person standing up for them is Donald Trump. And so therefore, this is probably the most, you know, in many ways, the most non-Christian, let me put it, Sharon, the person you could think of. But that doesn't matter because he is their he's their bulwark against uh, yeah. this. this it, 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 it's a uh, God sends different messengers to do different things, and, and but but what's scary is not just appeal to people that Tim talks about in his dad's church who become totally politicized. He is a giant figure in secular America. You remember Perot's vote was heavy secular. You know, these are guys that, you know, want to ride their motorcycle and smoke weed and have their, you know, girls clinging to the back of them and that kind of stuff. And Trump's, of course, they don't like any kind of racial minorities or anything like that. And he has appeals there, too. And I, I, I think if there were two courses and people want to get into politics and I was convinced to go into kid is going to study political science at Williams or something like that. And it's great if you want to be a political scientist. The two courses that I would recommend any young person take is biblical history and literature and comparative government. Because once you understand the Bible, you understand every narrative that's relevant in politics. Everyone. You can get Old Testament, New Testament, anything you want. And there's nothing that clears your mind more like studying other systems about your own. But that's, uh, he's a uniquely dangerous figure, that's all I can say. Very dangerous. I might also add Richard Hofstetter's uh, the, the paranoia style paranoid style of American politics, but he is a uniquely dangerous figure. James, uh, some of the Biden people, um, you know, apparently uh, uh, we're, we're pleased with the New York Times Siena poll that came out this week. The contrary to a lot of other surveys showed among likely voters, Biden two points ahead and um, I guess two points behind among registered voters. I would love that to be the case, although I'd, I'd like a big, bigger margin than two points. I, I think they may be deluding themselves a bit. I think they may be deluding themselves a bit in that. Uh, a, and that's a two-person race. Not going to be a two-person race. It's going to be a four- or five-person race. And every time you throw in someone else, that Trump base, those people you were talking about, are so fervent uh, that you don't shake them. But you do shake some of the Biden people. And the second th thing is I looked at some of the questions they asked and the results, particularly on the Israeli-Hamas war in Gaza, it divides the democratic constituency to an extent young people and blacks are increasingly against israel in this conflict uh, and that's the democratic base or a big part of the democratic base and uh, if that war continues for another seven eight months boy that's a big problem for joe Biden. you know in terms of blacks and you know, other people I'm, I'm, I'm harking back to something muhammad ali said during the Vietnam War. There ain't no Viet Cong ever called me a blank. Yeah. All right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's all right. <laughs> they take for the worth, but pretty goddamn effective. And I think a lot of blacks, well, I think this thing in the Middle East is, I think Netanyahu is trying to, hates Biden, hates, you know, wants to, save his own political self and is going to drive us into a political disaster. And what cracks me up is all of these billionaires saying the problem we have is some little snot-nosed 19-year-old in the Harvard yard that don't know what river or sea that he, she or he or whatever is talking about. And the real problem is the massive negligence and criminality and to save his ass and be being Netanyahu. I think people are focusing on the wrong issue here. But this this is splitting us and it's going to continue to split us. And I, I it's just one of any number of problems that we face with and that 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 pretty serious and they're pretty deep.
Sure is. There was a good frontline documentary this week uh, on uh, BB and uh, the Israelis. Uh, this is, I mean, he really is a Trump-like figure. Uh, he, he, it is all to save his own ass. Uh, he, his rhetoric against Hamas has been stronger than anyone's, and yet at the same time, he was going and supporting secretly funding through, through uh, gutter because he thought that that would tame them or whatever. Uh, he was so distracted by the effort, uh, huge. I mean, there were tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Israelis in the streets protesting his efforts to basically overturn the judicial system that has served that country so well, uh, that he was distracted. He wasn't paying attention. And October 7th, not only was on his watch, I think it was his fault. Well, it's so, it, 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 it's that and it's so much more. Let, let me say, I have a strong suspicion. I have no proof, but I have a strong suspicion that, that BB wasn't going to let hundreds of millions of dollars go from gutter to Gaza without some of it getting rerouted in his own account. I, I just firmly believe that that's a real area right for investigation because we know him, we know how cynical he is, we know how crooked he is. We know how narcissistic he is. We know how he cares so much more about himself and his own ass than he cares about his country. I, 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 I continue to believe that, that BB got a cut. And he thought he had everything outsmarted. He was doing the work permits. Unit 8200 in the Israeli the IDF kept saying all this stuff is going on. They had the plans. They knew what they were. It, the, the, and I said that this was the most negligent thing to happen since maybe 9-11. There's no 9-11 qualified here. This is the most negligent act by any government that I, I can remember at any time in the last hundred years. It, it just stunningly Massive, and there's one person to blame for all of this crap, and it's BB Netanyahu. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't agree more. Oh, man, so I'm on the road. I'm in, I'm in Philadelphia, and I got my stuff in my place that I generally sleep at this time of year. I couldn't sleep last night. <laughs> I'm supposed to start carrying them, see if I can carry Miracle Maid and my, my carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Winter is definitely here and the heaters are blasting. It's led to us struggling to find the perfect temperature in the past. But there's a new way to sleep in perfect comfort all night long using NASA inspired silver infused bed sheets by Miracle Maid. Miracle Maid offers a whole line of self cleaning eco-friendly bedding such as sheets, pillowcases, and comforters that prevent 99.7% of bacteria and require three times less laundry because they stay fresher three times longer. Now you're going to stop sleeping on bacteria that can clog your pores, causing breakouts and acne. So sleep clean with Miracle and trust us. With no more gross odors, life is a lot easier on your spouse. That's because they use silver-infused fabrics inspired by NASA, which also make Miracle-Made sheets thermoregulating for maximum comfort at just the right temperature. Imagine getting better sleep every night. Even better, Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. They feel as nice or even nicer than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. You'll feel like you're on vacation every time you get into bed. That makes Miracle Sheets the perfect gift for your spouse, friends, or family. Who doesn't want better sleep and luxurious feeling bed sheets? And since these come with three free towels, you get two gifts in one just in time for the holidays. So go to trymiracle.com slash war room to try it today or gift it to someone special. This holiday season, we have got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40% if you use our promo, War Room, at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle's so confident in their product, it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to TryMiracle.com. 
dot com slash war room and use the code war room to claim your free three piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash war room to treat yourself, a friend, or a loved one for this holiday season. You also can find the link in our show notes. All right, our immediate guest here uh, is Judy Woodruff. James Carvo, you want to grill her? I mean, I I, I, th- I think you're a better position. I, well, I, 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 so, so, Judy, for, you know, you famously uh, had a TBS News Hour for a long time and to, to great uh, accolades and justifiably so. But is, aren't you in a, doing a new thing with your life? And can you tell us what it is that you're up to these days? Because I don't think we've, none of us have had enough Judy Woodruff. We're always open for more. Well, you know, anything to get out of the house because, you know, you know who is at the house um, much of the time. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm obviously kidding. And now now I know how you're spending your Wednesday mornings and afternoons. I've been wondering what you were up to behind closed doors. James, what I've been doing since I stopped anchoring the news hour in December of 2022 is actually embarking on a, a journey around America trying to understand why the country is so divided. I've been covering American politics for 50 years plus, and I have never seen the country as uh, what what looks to me like as divided as it is right now. So I, my fortunately, my colleagues at the News Hour agreed this was a good way to get me out on the road, and that's what I've been doing. We've um, since January, February spent. We've we've now reported 20 pieces. We visited um, I think 14 states. Um, and we've talked to dozens and dozens, scores of Americans about what's on their mind. And what we've learned is that, yes, for sure, we are divided. And a lot of it has to do with with um, the fact that over the last few decades, Americans are not only farther apart on issues, we think worse of people on the other side. I talked to people at the Pew Research Center who started out the year telling me, uh, you know, that Americans are not only um, more uh, uh, at, at farther divide at a, at a larger divide on how we see the big issues, but we also think, for example, four years ago, what is it in 2016, 45 percent of Republicans thought Democrats said they thought Democrats were immoral. Today, it's 72 percent of Republicans think Democrats are immoral. The same percentage would say Democrats are dishonest. So you've seen a huge increase in this idea that people in the other party are not only wrong or misinformed, but they're bad people. And it contributes, I think, to this, you know, this issue people talk about at Thanksgiving. You can't even sit down and have a conversation with your Uncle Jim or your your own daughter about uh, issues. Uh, but it's that you just assume every you lump everybody into that into that kind of dark category. So that's one of the things we've seen, but we've been all over the country. We've been to Oklahoma, which is where I was born. We spent time in Tulsa, which is a city, as you both know, which is wrestling with its very difficult past. A hundred years ago, there was that awful, horrible massacre in the Greenwood district, what they call Black Wall Street in Tulsa, an an area of the city uh, where blacks had done very, very well. They were doing financially, they were financially successful, uh, but there was an incident and it ended up with uh, whites com- coming in and and setting it on fire and killing um, uh, dozens and dozens of, of, um, of blacks. Uh, the legacy was hidden and, and covered up by the city of Tulsa for a life, many, a number of lifetimes. I never heard about this when I was in the few years I lived in Tulsa before I moved away. My family members never heard about it. But in the last few years, it's come forward. The city knows about it. Their Republican mayor today, um, G.T. Bynum, is working to try to bring the city together around some kind of solution that will begin to address um, the huge inequality that's grown up in that city uh, ever since, you know, that part of Tulsa was wiped out. And uh, what we've seen is that you know, he as a Republican is trying to deal with it, but he's also addressing conservatives in Tulsa today who want, who don't want the history of race taught in the public schools. 
And so we are, you know, that's just one example, anecdotal example, but it's it's indicative of what what the country is dealing with. Are you hopeful that at the end able to offer some ideas on how, how to see any of that in, in the horizon? James, I would like to say yes. Uh, and in fact, um, as I think you know very well, there are these dozens, hundreds of these so-called bridging groups around the country, like Braver Angels and Common Ground uh, and Listen First, that are trying to bring people together, have community sessions or even neighborhood meetings where a neighbor sits down with neighbor over a cup of coffee or a beer and they try to uh, talk across their political differences. But that's one person at a time or one effort at a time. It looks like those things are happening. They are happening and they're happening across America, but they don't seem to be having an impact yet here in Washington or in state legislatures. I mean, you are I mean, as both you and Al know very well, state legislatures are the places where we're seeing some of the fiercest fights today over issues from education to immigration um, uh, to you name it. And so um, I would say these eff- these efforts are to be commended and we hope they continue. And I, I will tell you that for the special that ended the end of the year on America at a crossroads, I sat down with three respected thinkers, uh, retired federal judge Michael Ludig, Vanderbilt historian Nicole Hemmer, who has studied the history of the modern conservative movement. And we also talked with former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick. And Governor Patrick spoke about the importance of listening to other Americans. He said, what we don't do anymore is we don't listen. We don't respect other views. We just write people off. He talked about the people who are Democrats in red states, who are Republicans in blue states, and how they just feel completely ignored and nobody's listening to them. You hear that from Americans who live in rural parts of the country. So I think, I do think listening is a start. Do I think there's enough of it? No. But I think, I do think there are efforts, there are clearly efforts to, to bridge the gaps, but we just don't see critical mass yet. Can I weigh in here just for a minute? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Because uh, I, I did, there was a piece today in the San Francisco Chronicle about Johnny Burton. Johnny Burton's 91 years old, of the famous Burton family out there, Phil, Johnny, and Sal. They were the ones that actually were among the mentors for Nancy Pelosi back in the, uh, back in the 70s and 80s. And Johnny Burton noted when he was in Congress, there were three John Birch members in the Republican caucus. And he said, "We, I didn't vote with them on anything. I thought their views were just terrible. But every one of them I could talk to, I could even go have a beer with. Today, that's not true of those right-wing Republicans. You wouldn't go have a beer with Jim Jordan. You wouldn't go have a beer with James Comer. Uh, Michael Johnson probably doesn't drink beer. And I think that's one of the things that, that, that certainly has changed in Washington. As Judy said, I suspect the same is true in state legislatures. Yeah. Uh, I I think I also think that um, uh, the demise of local media has had a, a tangible effect on our division. Not only do I think it, but the scholars who've looked at the fact that over 2,500 newspapers, weeklies and dailies have closed down in America over the last couple of decades. Tens of thousands of reporters have been laid off. Communities aren't getting the kind of coverage of their city council, their zoning commission, the, the the city council. People don't know what's going on in their community. The glue in these communities is is now disappearing. I interviewed uh, this rancher and others in this tiny town in the panhandle of Texas, Canadian, where the Canadian record ceased publication this past spring after over a hundred years. And this rancher was in tears talking to me about how this was the newspaper that was a story of his family over the last couple of generations and how he read about his children and his grandchildren's high school football games. And he read wedding announcements and obituaries and births and city council meetings. And all those things are just not being covered anymore. He said, there's a mention on Facebook, but it's just not the same. And when you don't have that knowledge of what's going on in the community, you don't know, people turn to national news and I hate to say it as somebody who's been a national, quote, journalist for decades, for 50 years, 
But national news is very polarized. It's binary. It's right and left. It's up and down. And people aren't hearing about the middle. They aren't hearing about compromise. And I, I, people begin to think there's no way. It's either my way or the highway. And while I think it's entertaining and it's um, it, it brings eyeballs, as they like to say in cable news, and it brings listeners in, in talk radio, it doesn't bring solutions. And so watch what's going on right now in Congress. They can't come up with an answer on government spending. They can't come up with any answers on immigration. And a lot of that is because nobody wants to hear or give in to the other side. Money's a big part of it. You guys talk about all these issues all the time. You both are so smart when it comes to understanding American politics, but the middle isn't heard. It's not it's not, it, it, it compromises a dirty word. Let, let me turn this to just a lighter moment for a minute. James, are you looking forward to Christmas with your grandchild? I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to, to Mary getting out here. She said the I'm Zoom is not it. working. Hi, right, there she is. Who right, so Mary? Sorry. Who it was my fault. We gave it the wrong time. No, we do this all the time. You guys will... Are you expecting uh, to have a fabulous Christmas with your grandchild? Well, I'm running around like a nut because today is Santa Claus Day. And these are, we, I think you met them at the BGR, but we have these like two friends here, two couple friends. And in the last year between us, we've had five kids. So we have five babies under two. We just had another one last night. Chase James, they named it James. What now, honey? And Terry and Jane named their baby Chase James. Oh, that's so nice of him. <laughs> <laughs> Nalty and Monsignor Nalty did not think it was nice to name their baby after you. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, let me just ask, this is not really a Christmas present, but does, does James change diapers? <laughs> you know what? No. And... Hmm. I was talking to some other like mother my age and said, oh, my husband never did either. Sam, on the other hand, which is kind of my fault because, and I was talking to Maddie about this because Sam does more work than she does. And she said, I'm glad you never let daddy change our diapers. He's kind of misses a lot of spots. <laughs> yeah, said, you just can't do it. It's easier for me. It's just too painful to watch. So I got <laughs> But I could take out the garbage. That's one thing I was good at. Was always willing to take the golf. No, I'll tell you what he was good at. He would take the girls in his jogger, and he would take them for ice cream every day, or he'd take them jogging every day. He was a good yeah. two-year-old toddler playmate. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's great. Judy is running off to an appointment, so right. we want to wish you all the the merriest of Christmas and a happy in the hopes that twenty twenty four somehow somehow will be better than 2023. Can I just say this, though? I want to say, because I was thinking about this last night. A year ago, at this time, you guys had just been down here. Such a joyous time. Last night, Judy Special was on. She's so amazing. And we had Liam. Other than that, this year has been... Yeah. I feel so unmoored and I'm so grateful for this little slice of carving out the space for serenity and con contemplation and reflection because we have so many blessings, all of us in our lives. But this year, I don't, it just, I think October 7th, amongst all the things, but October 7th just really was stabbing to me and I'm, I'm on my knees this year for Christmas. I'll tell you, I'm very grateful that we have the friends and the family and the support and the blessings that we do have. Because, man, the world is on tilt, I think. Yeah, I agree, honey. I, I, I agree, so. I'm just saying, that our son-in-law is Jewish, so our grandson is, I guess, I don't know what makes you have not very much on allocating ethnic portions of somebody. But, you know, Mary and I, you know, always... We're looking forward to taking him to Israel and taking him to Rome and seeing the different sites. And it this whole thing is just upsetting. Hopefully, you know, you're right. We had some good things happen this year, but some really. You know, and I've got to tell you, Sam's people, Sam, who's they're reformed Jews, 
But they, but but Liam is going to Hebrew school, and Sam is so upset. He's he served on a kibbutz. We have they're, friends they're more there. they're between reform and conservative, honey. They're pretty observant. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Go ahead. Well, I mean, yes, I know. But we were talking about that. They started their own little synagogue there, and Sam says he's going to start one if they're if it's not. You know, there are twenty five thousand protesters here in New Orleans. Sam. Well, yeah. I'm just, it's just like breaks my heart. Where's all this yeah. coming from? I'm sorry, you guys. I hope somehow it settles because we took our kids when they were young to Israel. And it was so remarkable. It was wonderful. They had a great time. Uh, first of all, I told them, uh, you know, we're going to go see the mighty Jordan River, which looks like a little creek. Uh, <laughs> and, and then they went in the Dead Sea and all, and, and, and only our daughter could stand it. The boys couldn't stand it, but they love Jerusalem. Why? Wait, why? I love the Dead Sea floating around and salt uh, and all that it was just restorative it, mud. It, it was actually Jeffrey who liked it, and it was it was Lauren and Ben who didn't. I guess they didn't like the, you know, whatever it is that comes out of there. I thought it was terrific, but they had a wonderful time, and Jerusalem was just you know, we didn't feel the least bit unsafe. Um, now, this was, this was, oh gosh, I hate to admit it, this was 30 years ago, probably, or 25. So I hope that you guys have that same, I hope things settle down. I really do, with that we get peace and you guys can have that same kind of enjoyment. There, there, there are people that say you can go now. I don't know. I, I would go yes, myself. I don't know if I'd right. take Liam. No, no, I wouldn't. But everyone said somebody I heard an interview the other day, somebody who was in Jerusalem. He said, I feel guilty because we're not. Every, he said everybody is signed up, but we're not really on the front lines. But it has united the country. Did you go to Masada when you were there? I'm just I'm so loved yeah. all of this. We really. did. We did. Is that not just breathtaking? Don't oh. you get a sense of the oh. sweep of history and the determination of these faith filled people? Oh. And I could climb then. I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, you know, it's an extraordinary country. And I think, you know, our, our, our dear friend Seth Waxman and Debbie Goldberg, his wife, uh, you know, Seth may be one of the most successful lawyers in America. They just left for Israel about three or four days ago just to go help doing all kinds of domestic uh, duties and chores and things that uh, people who are off uh, in the military, I uh, used to do. So there's a, you're absolutely right. The whole country is rallied around this, not around this prime minister, but they rallied around this cause. No, no. And I, when this is all said and done, and I'm not one to having been on the other side of this, I really resent when people, and by people, I don't mean us, but when opinion, conventional wisdom sets in when we don't know all the facts when it's a situation like this, having been on the other side of making policy for this kind of stuff. But to, it's really unfathomable to me how that intelligence could not, I mean, this was a major, 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 if James has taught me one thing about military history, it's logistics. The logistical setup for this had to be long time in the making and pretty hard to, for intelligence to miss. And, I know you guys have done lots of shows on it, but I want you to tell, tell me how this happened. <laughs> you know, there was a good front line uh, piece last night or uh, Tuesday night. And uh, James, I don't know. I can't answer that question. Yeah, I, I, you know, you know, we get layers like everything else. You know, we think we can we know history in real time. We don't. It keeps unfolding and the story is not going away. But uh Honey, I can't, I can't think, ever, just so you know, it's all my fault. I gave you the 1230 time. Of course, it was 1230 Eastern, not Central. And uh, we got the other stuff in, but you were a real trooper. You came in at the last minute. You swooped in. You saved the day. You're my heroine. Can't she's wait always, to get back home. You know, she's always fabulous, James, and it's yeah. always your fault. So there's nothing. We whipped you a Merry Christmas. We whipped you a Merry Christmas. Um, so, no, for wait. New Year's Day, I think I'm going to go to pick up Koshan, the cabbage, and the black eyed peas because Donald Link can just make them better than I can. I, Listen, I Mary pay. and James, a very Merry Christmas to you. And uh, um, uh, I, I was going to say, it, it, Mary is better late than never, but that so understates the case. Terrific, <laughs> Mary. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. Give Judy my best. She's my love. Remains our family icon. Love you guys. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Ciao. Love you. Bye.
Bye. You, you know, Ed, we've talked about this before. It, what this has done to like a single entrepreneur, I guess, I don't know, whatever I was, or people like that, salespeople, or, or people that just kind of live off their wits, to have something like this, I guarantee it would have saved me, I don't know how much money over my lifetime. And I think anybody that is in, does that kind of work or knows somebody that does that kind of work, you got to get this stuff or tell people to get this stuff right away. It, it, it's going to make a huge difference in the ability to get back to clients, the ability to collect, the ability to manage your finances, do everything. It's perfect. I think it's a great product. I love collecting. It's a great product. Yeah, you know, you're right. Because we know if you run a solo small business, you're an army of one. But you still need a CPA, a bookkeeper, separate payroll solutions, and more. So let Collective take care of the paperwork while you take care of business. Collective is the all-in-one financial solution for self-employed entrepreneurs that lets you focus on your passion, not your paperwork. Collective handles all the paperwork you dread, like business formation, compliance, taxes, bookkeeping, accounting, and even payroll. The best part? It's at a fraction of the cost of a CPA. Now, how much do you wish you had that back in the day when you were riding high, James? Yeah, I, if, if we've talked about this before, how much money I would have saved by just having something like this as opposed to going from bailing, fixing stuff on the, on the fly or not paying attention to it or having to pay a, you know, late fee for something. It, it would have made a huge difference. And, and I, I, I think I'm so happy that young people like me, you know, starting out, have something like this to because you need every advantage you can get because it's highly competitive out there. Somebody said one time it's dog eat dog out there or vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Collective specializes in S Corps, a tax election that saves its members an average of ten thousand dollars per year. Just think what kind of use you can make of ten grand. That could be you. If your business of one makes over 60000 in annual profit, then you're likely missing out on thousands in tax savings every year that Collective can help with. So join the thousands of people who are raking in the savings every year thanks to Collective. For a limited time, Collective is waiving the onboarding fee when you go to collective.com slash War Room and tell them War Room sent you. That's $199 value for free when you go to collective.com slash war room and tell them the war room sent you. That's collective.com slash war room and tell them that war room sent you. Now you also can find the link to big savings in our show notes. You know, James, like you, I am a huge sports fan. That's been tough in Washington in recent years. For 25 years, we suffered through one of the worst owners in the history of sport, Dan Snyder of the Washington football team. The 2019 Washington World Series winning baseball team and Nationals was one of my favorite moments in sports. Then the learners, the owners, decided to downsize rather than capitalize, and now they're taking forever to try to peddle the franchise, freezing any opportunities in the free market. I'll still go to Nats Park. I love being at the ballpark, but I fear the Nats are mired in mediocrity for a while. So my hope was Ted Leonsis, uh, the owner of the Washington Wizards and Capitals. Now he hadn't produced much of a basketball program, but he's a you know good citizen. This past week, he and Glenn Youngkin of Virginia fame agreed to move the professional basketball and hockey teams to Northern Virginia with an expansive new development, which naturally will be paid for mostly by the taxpayers, not the billionaires. Professional basketball is an urban sport. All 30 franchises are located in a city. I've been a fan for many years, and I've been a season ticket holder for many years. But if they move to Virginia, whether it's a half mile or 50 miles away, count me out. I'm hoping those Virginia citizens, however, will rise up and stop this policing. Well, there might. There's a lot of basketball left to play here. 
I, I guess my rage is President Biden appointed a, a jurist by the name of Del Manchi, M-A-N-G-I. He would be the first Muslim appointed to the Court of Appeals in the United States. He is, by every estimation, eminently qualified for this position. Jewish groups around the country have written letters in support of him. But of course, from what you could expect from the, I don't know, I, 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 what do you call Ted Cruz, Tom Cotton, Josh Howley? They attacked the guy for his religion, not for his expertise, not for the cases he decided, not anything that he ever did. And this, the, 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 the horribleness, the, the, the un-Americanness, the unpatriotism of attacking an eminently qualified judicial nominee based on the religion that, that she or he may be born into is disgusting, it's anti-American, it's the way this country is going. I congratulate, I'm in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia community in all of Southeast Pennsylvania and New Jersey is coming together in support of this guy. It just is a perfect illustration of how rotten and crappy people they are. And there's just no other way to say it, to, to attack, just like the judge who happened to, that Trump attacked for being Mexican. I'm Mexican, I'm American. I'm not Irish, I'm American. What the hell do you think he is? I mean, what is wrong with these people? I just, I, I, it, these are educated. Cruz and Howley and Cotton are highly educated people. It's not like they, some, Ignorant people just been in the boondocks and don't know any better. They know eminently better. It just is, it's just disgusting. No, it it's is disgusting. totally is. James, I'll tell you uh, a good story about a Republican and that sort of issue. It was about 10 years ago, and Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey was appointing a Muslim judge to the high state uh, court. And uh, Newt Gingrich called his office and tried to get a hold of the governor to warn him not to make that appointment because all Muslims basically believe in Sharia law. Christie refused to take the call, appointed the guy, who I gather has been, uh, you know, quite a good judge. And when Newt was trying, seeking higher office later, he tried to call Christie. And uh, Christie told his staff to tell him to go. I can't use this word on tell on uh, yeah, yeah. podcast. This but would go on must report they said about his avatar. Well, let's hear it for 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 Chris Christie on this issue. So yeah, it, it, and you know you, you know something you know what Chris Christie has zero future in the Republican Party. Yeah, yeah. All right, <laughs> they they can't stand him. The idea that somebody would appoint somebody eminently qualified to be a judge. All, all I can say is I'm hoping that Cruz and Howley and Cotton save Michigan for us because they need to run these spots in Dearborn and these other places to show exactly what these people think, who they are, what they're about. I, I, I just, I can't, I just can't tell you how upset this makes me. Well, I don't blame you and I don't know how he stands on this, but I'll tell you who's been just as bad with this kind of bigotry has been your senator from Louisiana, John Kennedy. No, it, it, there's an other one that knows better. John Kennedy's got a, a, a more impressive ec educational background than, than Bill Clinton or Barack Obama. Yeah, yeah. All right? Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's like it, it, the same thing is true. You, you can say, well, Cindy Hyde Smith, well, she's just an idiot, all right? A tuberville. A giant fool. He, 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 these people don't have that excuse. And I'm sorry, I'm great on the curve. And, and Kennedy is right on the curve with these people that absolutely know better. It, it, it ought to just be like Lindsey Graham and just not know shit and just flop around like a fish on the deck. No, you're right. You be right. more noble than what they're doing. Hey, James, how important is it to surprise your spouse and let them know how strong your feelings are? 
Yeah, got any ideas? Yeah, I do. Song Finch. Song Finch. Forget generic gifts that are just creature clutter. That's why I'm going to recommend to you a gift that's truly as unique as your relationship. And Lord knows your relationship is unique. A professionally <laughs> recorded song crafted just for the one you care about. And thanks to Song Finch, Song Finch is the ultimate gift to show how much you care. An original studio quality song inspired by your story. That's completely unique, personal, and last forever. You, you, James, don't do Happy Days Are Here Again. Song no, Finch, is this really true that they're yes. not actually can do this? Uh, it is. This it, is stunning. I know. It's for real. Song Finch walks you through a simple four-step process to create an original song. All you have to do is tell them about who the song is for, provide some personal details, and let them know the type of song you want. Then pick your favorite song, Finch artist, or get matched with one. And they'll pour their heart into writing, recording, and producing your original song in just four to seven days. If any of wow. you missed out on this for this Christmas or holiday season, you can do it again for any number of holidays. Oh, you got Valentine's coming up. You yes. got all kinds. You got Mother's Day. Right. You got, you know, this is the gift that can keep giving. You may not, I'm not going to get socks for Christmas or Father's Day. Gee, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm gonna do. <laughs> I really need another pair of socks. <laughs> Plus, special add-ons can help you to commemorate the occasion, even more like a vinyl record of your song, one-of-a-kind art crafted from your lyrics, or adding your song to a streaming services to easily surprise your unsuspecting recipient. Songfinch is the only original music platform that guarantees that you'll love your song or they'll work with you until you do. They stand behind their community of over a thousand artists and do every original song they create. James, it's been over 300,000 of them. Check out all the reaction videos online and you'll see why Song Finch is the ultimate gift. I gave Judy uh, one of those fabulous songs for, I guess, our anniversary uh, last year. And, you know, I was in good shape for a couple of days. So I would advise it to anyone out there. It's really a terrific product, and it's a wonderful, wonderful gift. And now for a limited time, Song Finch is letting our listeners upload their song on Spotify for free so you can listen to your new favorite song anywhere you go. Go to songfinch.com slash warroom and start your song. After you purchase, you'll be prompted to add Spotify streaming for your original song for free. That's a six. That's a $50 value. It's worth a lot more than really. This offer is only available for our listeners at our special URL songfinch.com slash warroom. That's songfinch.com slash warroom. And be sure to share your song with us. You can find the link in our show notes. Hey, James, now for those superb listener questions god they you know educate us and i i love hearing from them thad in el cerrito california says this is just down james carville's alley how would you compare and contrast huey long and donald trump does trump connect to the same type of voter that so enthusiastically uh supported long so thank you for this question and I, I'll talk a little bit. They were both, I think, Long sort of started. There's some evidence that he started out pretty good. He was crusading against shouty building codes for schools and, uh, you know, according to the Ball of King's men. But, but he did start out, he, he kind of started out with that you had to have something against because the bourbons and the upper class in Louisiana control everything. So he saw something, but he was like Trump. He was power hungry. One of the, so I'm listening yesterday to this guy. He's a very nice guy. He's, he's a, from Philadelphia, Sir Comish. And I've been on his show. He's very earnest. He, he's, he's a professional centrist. And he was quoting an op-ed piece by a guy named Schmitz that appeared in the, it will take a little time, but this is important, that appeared in the New York Times. And Mr. Schmitz's point was Trump is actually kind of modern. He kind of compromises. This is the most idiotic 
crap I've ever heard in my life. It's if Trump cares about ideology or cares about being moderate or cares about being conservative or cares about anything other than power and money. And to, to look at Trump as an ideological figure, it's insane. He doesn't care. He's like, I'm not going to cut Social Security and Medicare. And if, if, if they want Amy Coney Barrett or they want, I don't care who's on the Supreme Court, I would tag them and I'll take credit. The, the misinterpretation of who Trump is in this, in this country is staggering. Now, Long is, you know, as so many people do in history, kind of started out in what a, what a valid critique of something. And of course, this ended up in corruption and power like, 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 like you couldn't believe. Uh, a good friend of mine, Bob Mann, wrote a book. He's kind of like us. He's on, he was on a faculty at Manship. And he, he, he studied law and he wrote a whole book about the law and LSU. And he was sympathetic until he dug into it. And he said, I really wasn't sympathetic after you know the facts. And it, it long had that kind of way that at least some of the stuff he cared about was stuff that you should. Trump, there's nothing he cares about but Trump, nothing. And, and he's so much worse than anything we've ever had. You can't imagine it. And, and to, to explain him through the prism of political ideology is the most insane, nutty, stupid, goofy, vapid thing I've ever heard in my life. Agreed. That's what I really think. Jim, Jim <laughs> in Babcock Ranch, Florida, says we're only a generation or two from public lynchings, Jim Crow and Joe McCarthy. Have we evolved morally or psychologically? You know, Jim, the answer is yes and no. There's a lot of things that are a great deal better than they were during those eras you were talking about. They're certainly uh, people of color, minority Americans have far more opportunities. Women have far more opportunities than they did back then. And in that sense, you know, we've come a long way. Uh, but there is as much rancor or bitterness today, and it's not over civil rights or communism, it's over really relatively petty stuff. And I think it's driven, it didn't begin with Trump, but boy, he has exacerbated it. So it's hard to say that we're we're morally better off than we were during those times of 70 years ago when we when there were a lot of really bad and moral things occurring. Well, so you say, well, we built up, we had the Civil Rights Act, we had the Voting Rights Act, we had uh, different court cases, we had the uh, overfill gay marriage case, we had all of these things, in, in, or we had Roe v. Wade, and we thought that, well, we'd built a solid building block of, of foundation for rights. The truth of the matter is, you've never been so close to losing all of them. All of the struggle, you know, when, when, when black Southerners my age speak of civil rights time, they, they don't call it the civil rights movement, they, don't call, they call it the struggle because it was a struggle. And the gains that we have made are so women's rights. We, know we see that right in front of us. You are so close to losing them all, you have no idea. You have no idea. You have eons of Supreme Court cases, different interpretations, building on the Constitution. We've had constitutional amendment. The Constitution could be gone in a year. Done. for me. That's it. And, and you got people like Larry Tribe in, in, in Ludic saying that this stuff could, could blow a gasket so fast you wouldn't believe it. So don't people have a false sense of security that they have acquired through hard work and blood and sacrifice rights that are, are, are enshrined. They're not. They're in danger to pretend otherwise to be a fool. Nancy in Michigan. Nancy, next time, tell us where in Michigan. It's a big state. She wants to know, when will the Democrats begin to realize that they can't run the usual campaign race against these MAGA so-called Republicans? They both pointed out on several occasions at uh, this point, but what are they waiting for? Flood their zone, Nancy says. So whenever somebody says it's from Michigan, and 
you, you and you say where you you put your hand up and they can point to, they can point to where they are <laughs> on the thumb and the hand <laughs> you know about it, it's it's the greatest place to for geography they, they'll all point kind of right to it yeah uh, yeah I, I mean you're right it, it, there's there, there's you know usually you do these things and you get alarmed and you you, you know you 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 state the threat twenty percent more than it is to try to get people's attention. There is no way to overstate the threat. And the truth of the matter is, as I said earlier in the show, he's become a theological figure as much as a political figure, and he, he has to be attacked early, often, and ruthlessly. That he's a false prophet. That, that, you know, all he cares about the companies, the corporations, the Russians. His own you know, time. He had a chance to do something for you. He all did it for himself. And it's not the kind of thing that's going to, you're going to see big results overnight, but you got to start, you got to start early. And it's that he betrayed you and you can't use statistics, headlines, you know, George Clooney narrated ads or, or anything like that. It has to be all ordinary people talking about the sense of betrayal that they feel. And if you want to look at some of it, you can go to some of the stuff we did at American Bridge in 2022. But it, it all has to be organic and it has to be them talking to each other. That We have lost all credibility with them. Hey, Nancy, take that back to your fellow Wolverines and, as you say, flood that zone. I'm Mark, I bet Rancho Murrieta, California, says, should Trump be the 2024 Republican presidential nominee, what are the odds that Nikki Haley would accept the second spot? That'd make a formidable ticket. I think almost zero, and I'll tell you why, Mark. Because for Nikki Haley to be attractive for that second spot, she would have to really contest Trump. She'd have to become a real runner-up. To do that... She can't duck questions of Trump anymore. She has to take against him. She has to take the attack against him. Uh, she has to finish second in Iowa and then really go after him with Chris Sununu in New Hampshire. And I talked to somebody who knows South Carolina politics very well and said, it's going to be really hard to beat Trump in South Carolina. She fails at all that. And she continues to kind of soft pedal her criticism of Trump. She won't be successful. If she's successful, it'll be in part going after Trump, at which point he's so insecure, he'd never pick anyone who criticized him. It is true that Mike Pence endorsed Ted Cruz in 2016, but he said nary a word bad about Trump. So I don't. I wouldn't look for a Hugh Haley ticket. Uh, I don't know. I'm, 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 first of all, we know that Trump has no press worth. If he thought that somehow or another, if he picked Haley, it'd, it'd give him another two tenths of a point, he would. And I, I, I don't have any confidence in her. Uh, none. Zero. I think she would go in in pledge unyielding fealty to him. And by the way, she wouldn't have any choice but to do whatever he told her because all of them would turn on her. I I, I don't have I have no of course there's no reason to have any, no confidence in Trump. I think he'd do anything to help him get elected. I I I, I don't have any hope that Nikki Haley has a ounce of political courage. So far, you've been right. Shane in Minneapolis, Minnesota, says that you bristled, James Carver, with the idea that Israel is a colony, but Arab countries never welcomed the idea. It was imposed. They called the 1948 Declaration of Israel the catastrophe. If that history is not an example of colonization, what is, asked Shane? Well, first of all, it was sanctioned by the U.N., all right, there's such a thing as international law. The, the state of Israel is a recognized place. Uh, in Gaza, please read Simon Seabag Montefiore in the Atlantic. That just destroys the idea that Gaza is colonialism. I, I, there are any number of really legitimate observations that can be made about Israel, particularly its expansion of the West Bank settlements, particularly the way it's treated the Palestinians, the way that they tried to 
cut them out of the Abraham Accords, how they work with the Saudis, all of that. I, but I don't think what you're dealing with there is colonialism in the sense that we think of typical Western colonialism. James, I agree. Uh, and that shouldn't be the focus of uh, people criticizing Israel. Uh, Israel has not only has every right to exist, it's an incredibly admirable country. Uh, thank goodness for Harry Truman back in 1948. Uh, maybe Benjamin Netanyahu should read a little more history. But um, uh, I don't think it's a, it, it is a, uh, an example of colonization at all. Uh, our next question is from Jack in San Rafael, California. Kate Cox, he says, should be invited by President Biden as an honored guest to sit in the balcony next to First Lady Jill, perhaps the U.S. Surgeon General. Kate Cox was the Texas woman who was, I forget what it was, uh, I think about seven months pregnant. It was an abnormality. Uh, uh, and it was clear that if she went to, and, and, and had the, um, and had a baby, it would threaten her health and her ability to have another child. But the Texas, uh, courts, Texas Supreme Court and that, and that awful attorney general went to court and she was denied and she went, actually, she went out of state first and had an abortion elsewhere. If that's not an example of, of a totally legitimate abortion after whatever have you, 23 weeks. I don't know what is. And uh, Jack, good idea. I think she should be a guest at Biden State uh, Union. I, I concur. Because you got to tell what... I was listening to interview this 13-year-old girl in Kentucky that really came to money spot whose daddy had raped her and she went through a whole history and about how she talked to Governor Brazier. And I, I, I think this guy is on to something. You, you have to give something a human face. You know, if you just take the Amy Coney Barrett view of the world, well, you know, women have a husband, they get married, they get pregnant. Nine months later, they have a baby. And what's complicated about that? Just ask Cardinal Burke. He has the answer to everything. Right. And, yeah. and, and I think that this, this, our listener here has come up with a, with, with a really good idea. We have to start personalizing these issues. We have to start personalizing what happens to people when they're faced with these kind of challenges. And I think, I think, I think this, this, this listen has got one of the better ideas I've heard. I right wish on, it was mine. Right on now. Well, Jack gets credit for it. Jack in San Diego, California is the author. James, John in Gurney, Illinois. I really like this question. Senator John Fetterman of Pennsylvania is breaking with progressives on hot button issues as he shows an independent streak. He's called for the removal of Senator Menendez. Uh, could Senator Fetterman be a leading new style of Democrats who may gather independent voters who shy away from more left wing policies? Boy, it, it, God damn, they just asked these questions that I was thinking about the whole time. So, uh, Senator Fetterman, I, I was for Connor Lamb, was primary opponent, to be fair, Senator Fetterman, he beat Connor very well. And, and he was this kind of hero of the progressive side. I, I think that he was greatly aided by by Governor Shapiro. But, but be that as may, uh, he's shown himself to have a, a, a streak of, 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 of self-reflection and self-thinking. I mean, uh, I don't know, how, how can you criticize what he's doing on Menendez? I mean, this is, I, I know he's not, hadn't had his day in court, but God damn, the charges here are, are, are literally sickening. And, you know, he's got a constituency in what Hamas said to Israel. I mean, he's standing up against it. I, I can clearly understand that. They are coming after him. I saw uh, Sarah Jones, big left wing at New York Magazine, that I, I read a lot of New York Magazine, is saying, well, he didn't turn out to be what we hope. Uh, but the guy's, you know, he's he's a survivor. He's, he's come up with the most significant health challenges you could imagine. And he's kind of hanging in there and being himself. And I've never, I'm certainly much more of a John Thurman guy to date than I was a month ago, I'll say that. Yeah. I agree, and I'm Menendez. It's remarkable. The Senate Democrats have allowed the House, the House, 
to gain the ethical high ground by expelling George Santos or forcing him out. And the Senate just sits back and, I mean, Schumer basically says, well, he needs his day in court before the Senate Ethics Committee. Then he won't let the Senate Ethics Committee have that day in court. And they're just going to write it out. Menendez is, is, is you're right, it's sickening. You know, there, there, there's certain, this gradations, if you like treason or some crime, if you're that dangerous, they, they can walk you up pre-trial. All right, I mean, at, at a minimum, he shouldn't be getting any classified information about anything that the United States does. And I don't know how you can, you know, think he's the head of the Foreign Relations or Intelligence Committee. I don't, I don't know how you can operate in that realm without getting sensitive information. And what he's credibly accused of is passing some of this information on. I, I'm in, in, you know, once you say, well, Santos never got his day in court, and I, of course, I never was for expelling him anyway, but the stuff that he was accused of wasn't treasonous or what didn't, didn't, didn't help. A little bit of a different thing here. And, uh, I, I, I think this, this, this is not the Democrats' finest hour. I'll, I'll, I'll be candid We should it. also point out this is Menendez's uh, second run around this track. And it was found uh, not guilty, so you got to... Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. He, the Senate looked at that and said he brought discredit upon the Senate. Right. He wasn't, he wasn't found guilty. It was a hung jury, but he brought discredit. Okay. okay. So, you know, you did that. You give him another chance. And now he's done it again. Yeah, I, and I'm, no one's talking about saying he's he, he's going to go to jail or guilty. I'm just saying he is he has brought now even more discredit upon the Senate. And like they did with Bob Packwood and others, they have every right to say you're entitled to your day in court legally, but you are uh, a disgrace to the United States Senate. So, let, let me ask you a question. I'll ask the Democrats this. In, in, oh, why did Al Franken have to go and Bob Menendez done? That's if such, anybody can answer that question, uh, I, 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 I'll give them, I don't know how, what. I, I'll give, give you me the, a rationale. I will give you the answer, and it's outrageous, James. You are absolutely right. And the answer is Chuck Schumer, who otherwise I think has done an exemplary job as leader the past couple of years. Schumer was the one that, that uh, I mean, Jane Mayer recounted all this, that told uh, uh, Al Franken, you got to go. And Schumer's the one who's protecting Menendez. In defense. Uh, I, I just don't, I, I cannot, but like me, and I really like Senator Schumer, I don't understand this at all. I feel the same way. I, I, I just, I, I just don't, don't get it. He has been a and, great leader in well, a lot of ways. I, I think on the Franken thing, I think the other senators went to him and kind of forced his hand, to be yeah. honest with you. You yeah. could say it, it, it wasn't his idea, okay? It, no. it was, you know, Christian Gillibrand was the lead on it. Right. No, but it's, um, it's unfortunate. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Now, following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you check out the links to our sponsors, Miracle Made, Collective, and Songfinch in our episode show notes. We deeply thank you for supporting it because when you do, it helps make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. You also can find other shows you might enjoy in the Politicon YouTube channel or when you search Politicon on your favorite podcast sites. Now remember, please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room plan. 